Wow, we can really quiet down a room. Welcome, everyone. Um, so delighted to see so many of you here on this, on this evening for this incredible discussion that we're going to have. My name is Mary Grant, and I'm the president of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, and I'm so delighted to welcome all of you here this evening. We're particularly honored to host this evening's program in partnership with WBUR. Frankly, we couldn't think of a better partner to help us lead and highlight these important conversations here in the Commonwealth and across the country. So how about a round of applause for our partner at WBUR? I really appreciate their support. So just a little history on the Institute. Um, since our founding, we have um, really served to be a powerful voice on issues like this here in Massachusetts and across the country, leading the way on civil discourse and trying to go deeper and helping us to understand what it takes to have a functioning civil and engaged democracy. Last year alone, more than 20,000 students came through our doors and they stepped into the role of being a U.S. Senator for the day, sitting right in these very chairs that you're in now working on complex pieces of legislation, learning how to talk with one another, listening and practicing political empathy. In short, solving problems. I thought we should just bundle them all up, put them in a bus and send them to Washington. They did a fabulous job. And so when we, when we see this energy here every day, we know that we're making a difference in our future democracy. And throughout the day, when we have visitors with us using a handheld tablet and skilled facilitators serving as guides, visitors have the opportunity to explore a range of digital exhibits and daily interactive programs that weave together the history and current debates happening in the US Senate, along with Senator Kennedy's legacy of service in a call for all visitors to engage in their own communities. And our programs, like this evening's discussion, brings together our leaders with diverse perspectives and experiences for engaging conversations and to help us think through and address some of the critical issues of the day. It is our mission to educate and to empower. And with the run-up to the midterm elections, and as the U.S. Senate considers the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the U.S. Supreme Court, this conversation is timely indeed. We know that health care is very much on the minds of people across the country. In our most recent Kennedy Institute poll, we've where we, we released it in July, we found that among voters that health care was indeed their number one issue and what they would think about and consider as they go to the polls. And in a July Kaiser Health tracking poll, 52% of those voters indicated that they do not want to see the Affordable Care Act repealed. It is very much on the mind of voters. These are big issues to all of us, and I'm delighted that tonight we're going to have an opportunity to hear from experts in the field about some of these issues, and I'm certain that we will have a robust and engaging conversation. So it's my pleasure this evening to welcome and introduce to you tonight's panel. Dr. Jennifer Childs Roshak is the President and CEO of Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts and President of the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Fund of Massachusetts. She is the first physician to lead these organizations and is using her years of experience as a physician and medical director to improve access to quality health care for people across the Commonwealth. Monica Valdez Lupi is the executive director for the Boston Public Health Commission, the city of Boston's health department. She serves as the key advisor to Mayor Walsh on health issues and works to build innovative partnerships across city agencies to positively impact the health of all Boston residents. Mary Lou Sutters has been the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts since Governor Charlie Baker took office in 2015. She oversees the largest executive agency in state government that includes 12 agencies and the Mass Health Insurance Program that provides health coverage to 1.86 million low-income or disabled residents. Secretary Sutters, it's a great pleasure to have you back with us this evening. And finally, we are thrilled to have Carrie Goldberg with us to lead this evening's discussion. Carrie covers health and science for WBUR and is the host of WBUR's Common Health blog that serves as a go-to source for news and conversation about health, medicine, and science. Carrie, I'm gonna hand the program over to you and invite our wonderful panelists up to begin this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to open our discussion about women's health with just a mention of women's 
emotional and mental health and just acknowledge that the current news environment is very bad for it. And on behalf of all news media, I'd like to apologize. And I wish the news were different, but, but it isn't. And so let's, let's dive right into what would normally have been one of the later questions. But given what we're expecting to witness on Thursday, I think it needs to come first. What does the pending Kavanaugh nomination to the Supreme Court mean for laws and policies surrounding women's health care? What can we expect Massachusetts to do if Roe or the Affordable Care Act is overturned? Jen, let's start with you. Yeah, so thank you, and thank you so much um, to uh, the Institute and, and for being here, and I'm, I'm honored to be with my, uh, my wonderful colleagues. So, um, you know, um, this is a huge deal. Um, I think uh, we knew what was happening with the nomination. Um, Trump promised um, that he would nominate someone who would overturn Roe v. Wade and, um, and decimate uh, the, the rights of many people around the country. You know, I, I am concerned about this, um, as we all are, I think. And, you know, I think in Massachusetts, um, we, we will continue uh, to push back and fight back. Um, you know, I think we were just talking about this a little bit before. You know, I'd love to be in a position to say we could actually push forward and expand rights and um, include more people. Um, but I think for now, we would have to um, really focus on, on pushing back um, and making sure that access to health care, access um, to sexual and reproductive health care in particular, remains um, as accessible as it is in Massachusetts. So this is one of those questions where the three of us are all going to, to respond. Um, and it is the conversation we were having in the back before we came out, which is the three of us in our different roles spend uh, a lot of time now uh, engaging in what we refer to as defensive medicine on responding to potential or actions at the federal level. Uh, we would love to spend our time really thinking about uh, what do we need to do to address the affordability of health care, to ensure individuals have access to health care, to deal with health disparities, all those things that we know in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have a long legacy of believing that it's extraordinarily important to have health coverage and from health coverage then really deal with the issues of access availability, affordability, acceptability, really dive into the issues of health disparities. And not speaking for my two good friends here, I spend a lot of my time on sort of like defensive policy making of trying to ensure the things that are, we have in our state, that are important to our state, continue in our state, um, and to ensure that the Affordable Care Act uh, continues. It's mirrored on the Massachusetts law. Does it need to be revised? Probably, but you can't even have that conversation. Instead, we spend our time like, we need to have the Affordable Care Act as a basic. We need to ensure that women have um, access to full planning, full family health planning services. And so we don't, we don't have these other conversations around what do we do to move our state forward because we're engaged in this sort of defensive moment in time. Uh, thank you for that question, and I, I want to echo what Dr. Charles Rochek said. This is an important and timely topic for the three of us and all of you uh, to be discussing this evening. And I think we, in our individual roles, really do uh, reflect all the opportunities and the innovation that others uh, are looking towards uh, Massachusetts. And I think the a couple different things that I would add to what you've both said, and we talked about this ahead of time, is that we are in a different place than some of our uh, neighboring states, uh, you know, everyone in between, uh, having done work uh, at the national level in DC, we're the envy. And so, again, looking at how do we continue to in innovate when every day uh, from the Trump administration we're confronting one bad policy after another and trying to take steps here to be proactive and to prepare for tomorrow. And I think the one thing I worry about uh, is fatigue. Uh, given all of the crazy issues that are coming our way. We're talking about reproductive health tonight, but I think you can't separate all the issues that Secretary Sutter's talked about when it comes to immigration, 
uh, to uh, just basic civil rights. And so there's a lot hanging in the balance right now uh, for everyone. So I want to pause for one second for housekeeping. We will have 40 minutes of us talking and then 20 minutes for questions from the audience. So you might want to start, start thinking of them. So um, those were wonderful answers, but a little bit abstract. And I'm trying to wrap my head around, I'm trying to imagine because it's so handmaid's tale that in fact, the Supreme Court revisits and overturns Roe versus Wade. Can you? Paint me that picture of what then happens here in Massachusetts. Mary Lou. Yeah. It is, given how long Roe v. Wade has been established law, I have to say, I keep saying to people, it's established law. Um, it's, it is, I have to say, it is, it is extraordinarily difficult for me to imagine Roe v. Wade being overturned. Um, just as a woman who's, you know, in her mid-60s and, you know, walk, watching this journey, right? Uh, what should be like my private decisions, you know, are now out, are in the public domain to be debated. So in Massachusetts, here's the good news. In Massachusetts, we will be protected. Uh, Massachusetts has strong laws, um, have strengthened in the past year the laws to ensure women's rights and access to the full range of reproductive services available for us, our medical services. But that is Massachusetts. Um, and as we were discussing earlier, we could imagine Massachusetts becoming sort of a sanctuary state for women um, coming here in, ter in terms of having their um, medical needs taken care of. However, even in Massachusetts, um, depending on what other things happen at the federal government, we are going to see a widening um, health disparity around low-income women not accessing women who are immigrants and the like having much more difficulty, I believe, accessing family planning services. I mean, that's part of my worry about all of this. But I will just, it is almost, um, it's extraordinary to me that we're at this moment in time in history, that we are, that the that there's such a threat to Roe v. Wade. Just to add to the sorry, to add to the um, the concrete picture, um, and it is you know we're grateful that in Massachusetts um, there are laws that that protect access to safe and legal abortion, um, but there are many states where we see exactly what's going to happen. There has been um, a precursor um, in Texas. And what we saw in Texas was very similar to what we saw before 1973. We saw women, over a quarter million women, going to emergency rooms in Texas because they didn't have access to safe and legal abortion. So um, we know that that's going to happen. Complications, Complications either either um, either you know um, back alley uh, abortions or self-induced abortions. So um, we know what happens when access is taken away. And so um, that very stark picture of the hand Handmaid's Tale is very real. We'd love to put a bubble around ourselves, um, but the reality is we will become a sanctuary state um, in order to protect access. Um, but it's going to be a challenge um, because it's still a f the, the affordability piece still creates a huge barrier to moving people across basically you know, the entire width of the United States, save for two coasts. Um, when you look at where the access problems will be in a post Roe v. Wade world, um, it really is the entire expanse of the United States except for the West Coast and a little bit of the New England and uh, into the Mid-Atlantic area. So I'm just gonna add, in this state, I think we've been really proactive across really in a, a bipartisan attempt to shore up uh, the, the different laws and regulations in the state. So you, you referenced some of the uh, making the Affordable Care Act rules more concrete and actually expanding on what uh, was provided under uh, the ACA for women's health and really uh, getting payers to the table to support that. Looking at those arcane uh, laws that many states, including our own, have on the books that wouldn't be, con they would be unconstitutional. However, not knowing where uh, the, the confirmation process is uh, with the Supreme Court have passed 
uh, a law now to take back those. That was the nasty women uh, bill that was signed. And then I would say, I think you're right. I mean, we have nearly, and we talked about this, nearly universal health care coverage in the state. And we know that access to insurance is important. That card is not enough to address what we will and have begun to see are widening gaps. In the city of Boston, with really intentional efforts over the last five to seven years, we've been able to uh, decrease infant mortality across all uh, racial groups in the city, so between 2006 and 2015. However, the black infant mortality rate is 36%. Uh, and that, for blacks and Latinos, that rate is nearly two, more than twice as high uh, as whites. So these things that we're talking about in terms of access infant mortality. is the infant mortality rate among, black, uh, among blacks in Boston. And that is, a, that is decreased. So we can double check that for you so that you have uh, that, but I'm pretty sure that that was uh, what I was, uh, that, that the data that we have. But we've done a lot in terms of trying to uh, be proactive and really look at women's health from a life course uh, perspective. So when you're talking about women's reproductive health, it really is, in public health, we look at prevention. Uh, and before um, women get pregnant, really being able to provide comprehensive repro reproductive health services and asking the question about, are you planning to get pregnant this year? And depending on the answer, we, uh, giving the different resources and tools uh, that women need to make the decisions for themselves. Uh, and so that's some of the work that we're doing uh, in the city. And there have been a couple of times recently when the Trump administration defunded something and the Baker administration stood up and said, we'll cover you. <laughs> we got you, we got you. So are there any particular uh, threats or challenges like that are, that are expected to come next? And can we expect, again, Massachusetts to step up and say, no, not letting that through? Well, the most obvious one is, uh, most recent one is Title 10, which is family planning services. So um, in the spring, when, I can't remember what the trigger was, but it, it, it looked like the federal government was not going to reauthorize the funding for Title X Family Planning Services, which is about $7 million for Massachusetts. Um, the governor filed actually a, a budget um, uh, to actually for the coverage of Title X in the event that the federal government didn't come through. The title, um, federal government did come through. It's usually a three-year grant. and We just got our notice of award. Uh, seven months funding, uh, not three years funding. Um, my only solace was, my first thing was, is this Massachusetts specific or is this all states? It's all states. Um, and we are very clear that the governor will file in the event that this is no longer funded by the federal government, is considered discretionary funding, that we would step in to ensure that we continue to fund family planning, the federal side of the federal federal planning dollars, family planning dollars from the, that had been paid for by the federal government. Too many Fs in there, sorry. Um, so yes, we will step in. Um, one of the challenges for a state, as you think through the future, is, um, so I'll just use our Department of Public Health, for example, which is about an $800 million agency. I had one of those moments when I realized that 60% of our de state Department of Public Health is financed federally. You do the math. So if the federal government, so the state can't pick up every time, right, that if the federal government decides it's not going to fund all the things that the federal government has funded for Massachusetts. Um, but we are very clear that as these things come up that are very important to us and the ethos of our state, the state will step up. The governor will file. And, I'm, and as um, Monica said, um, is in a very bipartisan way, we have addressed these issues in Massachusetts. So concretely, so thank you for raising Title X. Uh, for us, that would, uh, we receive a Title X grant from one of your grantees, ABCD, and what that would mean for us, if that was lost, uh, and the federal rules went through, would be two staff who are health educators who go across 
eight uh, Boston Public High Schools to provide health education and referrals to uh, primary care sites, whether it's Planned Parenthood, their pediatrician, primary care providers like community health centers, and we would lose that ability to uh, support our colleagues at the Boston Public Schools. Uh, in preparing um, uh, for different scenarios, we're committed uh, to figuring out with the mayor uh, how we uh, wouldn't accept uh, those funds because we know what the evidence says in terms of the resources uh, that we need to provide to teens in high school settings. So like uh, Secretary Sutters and our, our colleagues at the state, we would try to be creative in figuring out other resources, but that's a big hole to fill. Certainly um, are impacted by, our patients are impacted by Title X as well. And just for the folks in the room who may not be aware, Title X is a program that's been in place since the 1970s. It's a um, program that provides um, either no cost or low cost preventive services. So all um, birth control, STI or sexually transmitted infection treatment, all very preventive. And one of the reasons why currently, and we'll, you know, I expect this will change, but um, we are currently at an over 30-year low for teen pregnancies, for unintended pregnancies, and for abortions. And a lot of it is because of programs like Title X. And so the idea that these preventive programs that really work are being threatened um, is really abominable. Um, because the progress that we have made is, is really incredibly important. And thankfully, we do live in a state where not only access to health care, but access to common sense, cost-effective, um, empowering preventive care like sexual and reproductive health care is a priority. So I'm grateful that, that, that our governor and our secretary um, and the bipartisan um, work of the legislature will keep that in place, but it shouldn't have to fall to states to protect access to basic health care that has meant so much to our country. And has had such positive health outcomes. Absolutely. We have the lowest rate of unintended pregnancies among adolescents in the United States. It's, it's all because of, of really good prevention work, and all, all of which could just turn on a dime. So then you're spending your health care dollars on right the, the treatment, the interventions, rather than the upstream preventions, that, which we know can be so effective. And so for the meanwhile, though, it does feel like women, in terms of women's health, are extremely lucky to be here in Massachusetts. And the question arises, is there, is there any way that the, that the women's health establishment of Massachusetts can be helping people in other states? Jen. So I, you know, I, I agree. Um, it is great to be in Massachusetts. But what I would say is um, there's a lot of work to be done still. Um, the secretary referenced and, and uh, the commissioner referenced the disparities. So just speaking around um, the lowest teen birth rate, six years running in Massachusetts, there are towns and cities around our state that have five and six times the teen, uh, teen birth rate of the state average. That's not okay. So, you know, there is still a lot of work to be done in communities of color and low-income families, um, low-income communities, geographically dispersed communities where access to health care, even in our state, remains a barrier. So, you know, I think we can be um, leaders um, in uh, being great role models and maybe extending, figuring out ways to leverage technology to cross state lines, but I, I want to keep our focus also on the fact that we we still have a lot of work to do, um, and I, I think we can do it, um, but I think um, it would be nice not to be distracted with all the rest of this stuff. <laughs> Mary Lou, Monica, you go I, I think that we have, um, our, fr our collective frustration is that our time, which is completely appropriate, is, is focused on what the potential federal rules are, if you would, um, which is the appropriate thing for us to be engaged in, rather than really having the time to invest in the things that we know we need to work at, work on within Massachusetts, which is health disparities, which is continuing to improve access and affordability and availability. Um, instead, we have to be we have to be focused on what's happening nationally. Imagine if 
Um, so the state has about $6.4 million of state funds into family planning services for state side, and there's about $7 million on the federal side. So if the $7 million on the federal side goes away and we invest, right, the state steps up to cover that, that could have been potentially $6 million that we could have invested in health disparities, right, as opposed to sort of offsetting what would be a federal cut. So it's, um, so I think that's part of our, you know, there's only, yes, I think that is part of our frustration, is we're fighting on things that you shouldn't have to be fighting on because we really should be focused on the things that we know we can do in our great state to continue to improve access and deal with health disparities and affordability. Uh, I guess the only thing that I would add is I try to, uh, and the uh, staff, at the health department do try to be optimistic, even <laughs> though every day it is a struggle. But what I will say is that I do think that as a public health enterprise, when I talk with and meet with other city health uh, commissioners from across the country, we have never been so laser focused in terms of the issues that mean the most. And so those, um, sort of the competition for resources at the local level, I feel like that has dissipated because as a community, we're mobilizing against all of these bad policies and trying to take. So we're very fortunate in Boston, but we talked, there are other examples in other cities and states. Uh, and I know that uh, this summer we worked with Secretary Sutters and colleagues at, at MassHealth on um, increasing access to long-acting reversible contraceptives. Uh, the city had filed a bill, it went to study, uh, but again, with bipartisan collaboration and looking at what was coming down the pipeline and other practices across the country, we were able to work with MassHealth and um, uh, the commissioner there, the, the director there, uh, to really look at how do we unbundle payment. We know that the evidence supports um, that LARCs are much more effective than oral contraceptives or the pill. And we know that uh, unplanned pregnancies, how can you deal with being uh, prosperous if you, are, if you become pregnant, like you said, in a town outside of our Boston bubble, in a school system where you don't have the supports, right? So, so I think that's one example where we do take lessons from other places, but are mobilized as a public health community in the state and across, I, I think, across the, across the country. So this was, I mean, this is, as we come together and there was this, um, it was truly an unintended, so it was a, an unintended consequence of how Medicaid was reimbursing LARCs. And it was from the Boston Public Health Commission and others uh, and Boston Medical Center that we realized that the financing of how Medicaid was paying for this was creating a barrier. And um, Maybe it's good to have a secretary who's a, a female and we sat at the table and, and we just, we figured it out and that has in, absolutely has changed. In addition, um, the governor uh, has, uh, we starting in October, November, are rolling out a statewide initiative of working with providers on educating them around LARCs to really increase the access to LARCs across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, about $1.7 million a year for five years to really Yep. Well, and we don't promote that. You know, we don't publicize that very much. But it's again, it's really trying to promote um, provider education, provider uncomfort sometimes around um, uh, larks and the like, and to really promote access. So, so again, in Massachusetts, we are we are continuing, I think, to improve access. But again, I think all of us are very focused on what's happening in Washington. It's hard. You have to be. Are you saying so? In other words, is it across party lines even that that public health commissioners from all around the country are kind of laser focused on? Yes. Yeah. Across party lines, but they are turning to us, so commissioners on the coast, uh, to lead. Uh, so it really depends on your context. But even in places where you might think, um, I, we had visitors, for example, from Kentucky, uh, and and they're innovating there. South Carolina, we talked about is an innovator and has been a leader around uh, because they have such restrictive laws in terms of women's health and reproductive health. So they're focused on a cost-cutting uh, measure, preventing uh, unintended pregnancy. So that's the language. When you're looking at the language, and when I worked 
uh, in DC that you have to look for the right language and the language that plays well in those more conservative red states really is show me the money, where's the cost savings? And so public health, uh, state public health officials have been very creative in matching the evidence with, by the way, working with our Medicaid agency, we could uh, contain costs and that could be diverted and invested in you know, public safety or transportation or in education. So th those are other creative ways, I think, that others are looking at the issue. Uh -huh. And what about, uh, Mary Lou, feel free to dodge this if you want. What, what is it? <laughs> what is it? What is it like to deal with the Trump administration officials these days? And what? Hi, what everyone. <laughs> what's the key? Just as Monica found the key, to, you know, what's the key with them? So we. Um, so I am grateful that it was at the end of uh, the President Obama's administration that. Um, I had to renegotiate a very large $1.8 billion Medicaid waiver, um, which is expanding substance use services extraordinarily uh, in Massachusetts, as well as preserved our safety net of about a billion dollars. Um, so we have a safety net care pool, which sort of sustains our hospitals and community health centers, um, which, uh, uh, and this is not a bipartisan. This is not a partisan statement at all. But the prior administration had negotiated a five-year waiver, but it was only funded for three. So when I first became secretary, I was like, "So where's the other two years of funding in this?" But for a lot of reasons, because it was the end of an administration, they hadn't completed the negotiations. So I had to complete those negotiations. We took it upon our. We took it um, upon ourselves to actually negotiate a new five-year waiver, so it doesn't expire until 2022. Um, and I'm grateful for that. For And you can you can read between the lines on that. Why? <laughs> um, no, we, so it's a very, trans, but it, it's on transactions. What I would say is it's a transactional relationship that um, between like a particular issue, particularly on the Medicaid side that we have. So it's like on that specific issue, and that's what we uh, talk about. The governor has. The governor um, works with our congressional delegation. He sends out, um, just like he did recently on public charges, he did on Title 10. He um, comes out with a very strong initial response, and then uh, he charges us to really get into the details of whatever the rules look like on the that, and then send a letter summarizing um, our position to the federal government. Is, is how we sort of engage. Anna Dine, and you did not say anything at all out of school. <laughs> I think say, yes. but it, it is a it's, it's, it's a, a very relationship. different um, um, relationship. Yeah. Than a, you know. So this will be my last question, and we'll open it up to the audience. And this is um, Jen, if you'll indulge me on my my issue of obsession, which is um, so I so roughly half of the abortions in Massachusetts now are medication abortions rather than procedures. So they're just done with pills. And what I keep thinking is, if Roe is overturned, and given that we've got a growing body of research about how these pills are safe and effective. Isn't that the alternative to the back alley? In other words, won't the country just switch over to ordering these pills online and in that sense maybe we won't go back to the bad old days before Roe? How, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, so I think in a... Um well, in a perfect world, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Um, but, you know, I think, um, so you're right. And I, you know, I do actually think that this has been one of the real um, advances in sexual and reproductive health. Um, certainly um, terrific for, for women to have additional choices, um, especially earlier in a, in a pregnancy. Um, but, you know, I think one of the concerns is that there are, um, multiple states, up to 20 states that have laws already queued up um, to criminalize various aspects of sexual and reproductive health care. So there are laws that will put a, a physician in jail if they um, perform an abortion or prescribe a, a pill um, that results in an abortion. There are um, state laws that criminalize women um, who seek that care. So there are multiple ways that, um, that I think 
you, you know, we're gonna end up having to deal with lots of variations on a theme. The main theme, though, is essentially um, eliminating access to a safe and legal medical procedure that um, we know saves lives, um, ultimately. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I think it, it, it would be nice to think that that would be an easy solution, but um, there there are some groups that are working, you know, kind of underground groups that are figuring out how to use mail order, um, and you know, people can Google um, self-administered medications, um, but that you know, it's essentially will be a black market and will put people at legal risk. So, you know, I don't think anyone's thinking that that's actually a great solution. Um, and then the other, I just, sorry, truly last question. We, we were talking before about a sanctuary state, which also could, I mean, it raises the prospect of abortion tourism to Massachusetts. Is that something that Planned Parenthood has thought about? Well, I don't, I don't speak for the whole organization, but I certainly have thought about it. Um, because, you know, um, as a, family physician for over 20 years. I had patients who went to, you know, all sorts of places for all sorts of things that were much harder to, to do than, um, than have an abortion. So, you know, I, I think you go to India for your cardiac, uh, you know, cardiac surgery, come to Massachusetts. Um, you know, I think that the care that we provide at Planned Parenthood and, um, I'll just, say, you know, it's high quality and um, empathic and non-judgmental and, um, and, you know, that's what we're going to keep doing. And our doors are open for anybody who can come. And if we get to the point where we have to figure out how to help people get to see us so that they have a safe, respectful, um, autonomous um, decision-making process, then we will do that. Um, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I imagine planes flying and Airbnb and all sorts of creative ways to make sure women have access to um, safe and legal abortion. Abortion is such a personal and uh, uh, complicated decision. Um, it really should be a private decision. It's hard for me to imagine that it's like a you know a, a tourism kind of event, right? That people are like, oh, I'm going to go to Massachusetts for. Um, Cape Cod and go have an abortion. I think it's a it's an extraordinarily um, personal and difficult decision, which I think what is what makes this such a troubling time. That really, sh what should be a very private, personal or family discussion with a trusted physician or provider of theirs to make, should be in the privacy of that medical office, that clinic office and it's become so extraordinarily politicized um, in a way that I think um, for someone who's growing up in the women's right movement, and my first book, my first books was Our Bodies, Ourselves. I, I mean, I just sit here, I, not as secretary, but as a woman, just um, part of this is just extraordinarily um, troubling that we're even having this conversation, quite honestly. In, in not just Massachusetts, but really in our country. Because we will again, in Massachusetts, for women, we will be protected. Um, I can't imagine a, that ever really undoing in our state because of the laws, because of the ethos of our state. But for so many other women in parts of our country where there have been some gains, maybe not enough gains, but some gains, of that being really undone is just an extraordinary moment. And I don't mean extraordinary in a positive way. So I would say that I think that notion, uh, looking into the future, and the tourism, like uh, you know, abortion tourism, I agree. I mean, I think we think about the disparities, and I just double checked, it decreased by 36%. We'll get you the mortality. That, yeah, Sorry about that. that. Like a, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Relative. It was a relative. Percentage. Sorry, lots of lots cramming. Of, uh, so, uh, so uh, we talked about um, we're fortunate in Massachusetts, but I think it'll just further perpetuate what we see in terms of uh, women who have access to resources that can get on those planes, who actually have broadband internet access and can get on that Airbnb website and come here, and the people who are going to suffer 
are women of color and uh, low income and immigrant uh, women and their families. Can you envision efforts aimed specifically at helping them? Yes. Like what would that look yes. like? Yes, yeah. I'm shaking my head. Yes, absolutely, because I don't, you know, we, this is not, um, this is not a have and have not situation and should not, should not be. Um, it just makes it that much harder. Um, there currently are ways to help people um, with justice funds, they're called. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we would be looking at um, a much bigger um, hill to climb. But I think, you know, the, the, all of us um, in the, you know, I think sexual and reproductive health world um, and just women's health in general, you know, would be looking for ways to m absolutely guarantee that we keep those disparity gaps um, as close to zero as possible. But it'll be a challenge. So you think like a huge philanthropic effort or something like that? Potentially. Yeah. <laughs> I can't quite read the tea leaves. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Just raise your hand. Do we have, to, you have the mic back there? So I am currently a master's degree student in clinical social work. What advice would you give? So having worked in the community service, having worked as a victim witness advocate for a district attorney's office, what advice would you give to students like myself who want to advocate for women's rights, but have seen clients come from other states who have had really difficult decisions and haven't had that access and the impact it's having on their lives now. What would you suggest to someone like me, who's a year away from graduation, that I could do to advocate for women going forward? Are you gonna stay here? Don't know yet. Okay. <laughs> Make sure everyone votes. I mean, I, you know, I say that, like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm frustrated, I'm not gonna vote, you know, but I'm like, no, you wanna vote. So that's, that's minimally, make sure you vote. I'm gonna let you. Sure, yeah, I would definitely second the vote, voting. Um, but I also think, you know, um, stay involved, you know, um, really, I think, you know, get involved with an advocacy group that feeds your soul a little bit too. I think the work is hard. So, um, you know, find your village because um, it's, it's going to take a village um, for all of us. Um, so I think, you know, try to keep that, that balance so you keep your optimism and you keep your energy up. I was going to say, while this has been a sort of a sobering conversation, um, none of us would be sitting here if we didn't have hope that we can't continue to move this. And so if we've been sobering, I think it's just the moment in time, but um, none of us would get out of bed in the morning if we gave up hope. So keep the fire in your belly and keep hope. And um, social work will benefit for your graduation year. And I do lots of networking, so you can, I, and I answer all my emails. I'm a little slower than I used to be. We're actually looking for three social workers uh, to work in our school-based health center. We can talk. Uh, but uh, the other thing I would say, and what you've just shared with us, is, uh, is your story. And you're seeing people from other states. And to, so to find a way that you can channel what you're seeing on the front lines and in the trenches and lifting those up and sharing those stories, that's what policymakers need uh, to hear, our real stories, not just the data and accurate data, not like I just shared, uh, but really uh, the stories to bring uh, the data to life. Right. Data, data helps create the environment for the story. It is the narratives that give life and the sense of urgency and passion to move issues. Hi, I'm an OBGYN nurse practitioner in the city, and I take care of patients. I think I've met someone from every country that exists. It's really a great job. But I take care of a lot of immigrants, some of whom are here undocumented, and I'm particularly troubled by the recent uh, machinations of whichever three-letter nasty agency is tormenting our immigrants these days, uh, in particular the government charge uh, would, would things such as benefiting from Title X birth control pills be considered 
a public charge that would prevent one from pursuing a green card just seems as absurd as anything a novelist could come up with. Is there a question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just would, would like people's thoughts on that because I'm concerned, I mean, WIC, which is for the children who are citizens, is, is gonna be seen as a negative thing, and birth control, I mean, people are damned if they do and damned if they don't. What, what is actually one of the few things that actually wouldn't get counted? Um, so this, so public charge, May I? I was like, she was gonna ask me a question if you didn't. So public charge is probably to many of some of you a benign sounding government term. It is something all of us should get to know really quickly. So public charge is sort of a, uh, a litmus test, if you would, used by the federal government to determine whether someone um, is eligible for uh, citizenship. Um, for 20 plus years, there have been three things that sort of could um, disqualify you, if you would, as um, potential for citizenship. So two benefits, one is SSI, the other one was TANF, uh, and then the third was if somebody was, so these are not my terms, these are the federal terms, long-term institutionalization. So basically, if, you, if it's perceived you could become a burden on the government, then it could deny you citizenship. Long-standing, 20 years, those are, have been the rules. Um, last spring, there was a leak uh, around that the federal government was gonna change the rules. Um, and in fact, on Saturday, uh, Homeland Security has posted a 477 page document that if you went to law school, you can probably interpret what it means, but essentially would really broaden all the categories that would really serve to limit um, individuals' path to citizenship in the United States, and includes things such as um, food stamps, SNAP, so I'm trying to use like um, SNAP, Section 8 housing subsidies. Um, probably one of the few things it doesn't include is WIC. Uh, it would include Medicaid, and it would really serve, it also discriminates individuals over the age of 61, under the age of 18. So if your parent was here, um, and you're born and you're on, and you're, you come from another country and you're on Medicaid um, as a child, that could disqualify you as being eligible for citizenship um, as an adult. Individuals who come here on employment visas or educational visas who then apply, and if you know if you're in school in Massachusetts, there's a requirement that you have to have health insurance, and lots of people are poor, so they're on Medicaid. So imagine you come here for school, you're on Medicaid as part of um, the requirement to be in school here, and then you're working, that could actually disqualify you for citizenship because you are on Medicaid while you are in college. So these are, so first of all, this is proposed, it's not yet even published for public comment. Um, the governor came out on, that was I think uh, posted on Saturday, um, on Monday morning, the governor came out with uh, a very strong statement that how opposed he is to this. Uh, I have an army of attorneys now starting to write the comments, as are many people. Uh, we've partnered with like Mira uh, and Healthcare for All because my job is to get people on benefits, right? So if you call MassHealth or the Connector or the Department of Transitional Assistance, I want you on benefits. But because of the worry that's out there on our website and on all of our website is directing individuals if they're worried about citizenship or how this may uh, affect them going forward is we refer people to non-government agencies um, such as Healthcare for All and Mira and the like. But all of us who like never knew anything like what does this public charge is, we need to be very intentional about this. Um, so thank you for asking that, and I hope I explained that a little bit. And really what we're doing is, so we, the federal government has, when people thought about immigration, it was around undocumented um, aliens. Um, and then we sort of took steps about people on temporary um, work status, right? And now is, this is really around legal immigration, a pathway to citizenship, which is the backbone. One in six residents of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is foreign born just to put this 1.1 million people in our state.
These are our neighbors, these are our employees, our employers, this is our community. Thank you for that. So what if the, oh, okay, sure. So all of these programs run on money, and what if uh, that 60% from the federal government goes away and the recession hits um, because of, of um, you know, tariffs or irrational exuberance? Um, how is Massachusetts going to respond? And I guess I, I'm not sure that there are enough one percenters who are going to step into the gap to, to, uh, to handle that. So I, I'd like to hear how, what's Massachusetts going to do? As one of the one, one of 6.78 million people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, <laughs> um, but on a, on a seriously, I think, I think what the position of state government, the executive branch, is to really, one, educate all of us about what the potential of some of these, um, like Title X, public charges, the impact of those on our state and to do everything we can to ensure that our state is protected. That really is sort of our, um, rather than engaging in hypotheticals, what ifs, what ifs, is really being in a very sort of intentional public response um, when the federal government um, proposes something. We have been successful to date. For example, if I just use the ACA, um, there is no question that uh, some people in Congress, and certainly the president, wanted to dismantle right, um, the ACA. And um, it's not even on life supports that, that um, a number of gov uh, governors, like Governor Baker, with a bipartisan group of governors, uh, really worked very hard with their congressional delegations to really put that back for a while. So I, um, so I think that's, I think that's got to be our strategy. Um, is to really, the federal government has been a partner with states on funding of very key infrastructure kinds of programs, however you want to define that. And I think we have to ensure that the federal government uh, continues to be a partner. When we have recessions, we prioritize what are our safety net services and we build up from that. And I think, you know, during um, times of recession or difficult times, or even during regular budget, budget season, I think we, we all, whether it's a state-based or, you know, personal finances even, you know, you have to make, you have to prioritize and you have to make smart decisions around things that have really good return on investment. And very few things have better return on investment than birth control and healthcare in general, but birth control for every dollar spent on birth control, you save $7. So it is a good investment to be thinking about some of these programs. Maybe not every program, but you know, I think the preventive health care piece um, is well proven to be a really good, and not only the right thing to do, but a really good investment in good times and bad times. I am not so eloquent, but I am also in my mid-60s. I just retired from a 45-year history as a nurse and was able to travel across this country. And given the statistics that you've given us with the decrease in, at 36% infant mortality rate, I'm not sure that people realize that we're talking, that's millions and billions of dollars saved. What's the problem? I mean, I, is, it, is it that they don't want to listen to good, solid evidence and support it financially? It, and if that's the case, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, because I did work the payer side as well as having worked the provider side. What's the problem? So, <laughs> I'll take this one. Um, you know, I mean, it is, it is a little bit of crazy town. And... Um, <laughs> You know, what I would say, you know, the way I think about this, too, is, you know, when I ask, well, what is the problem, you think about, you know, um, using LARCs or long-acting reversible contraception really reduces the unintended pregnancy rate. Um, you know, why wouldn't you, if you are anti-abortion, why, why wouldn't you invest heavily in that? 
that's again another example of where it doesn't really add up. And the only thing that um, sometimes makes sense to me is that it doesn't make sense because it's really not about making sense. It's about political agendas. It's about keeping people down. It's about keeping an, in, you know, an, an inclusive club that it's exclusive to everybody else. I'm not going to answer that one. <laughs> we were, oh, sorry. Oh, two more. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just a couple of questions on um, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood has uh, new leadership at the national level, and I've wondered um, to what extent you would see an impact, uh, not only in Massachusetts, but in other uh, states and regions. And what's the risk of Planned Parenthood being defunded? Because I'm guessing there's a spillover effect in a lot of things that we're discussing here. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked both, both of those questions. Thank you. I'll start with the defunding first because there is a, um, a lot of misinformation about um, you know, defunding Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood does not have a line item in the federal budget or a state budget for that matter. We provide health services for patients, we bill for health services, and then um, we either you know, get paid or don't get paid. But um, we provide healthcare services in a transactional way, just like any other healthcare provider. So when you talk about defunding, you're really talking about um, eliminating access to care for services through Medicaid um, or through other federal programs. So, so um, I do think that, um, and it's been very very clear, the Trump administration, um, HHS, nationally, you know, they are out to um, try to cut off any funding um, for Planned Parenthood, um, specifically, but generally, you know, for a lot of the preventive programs. So, you know, I think we will do what um, every organization um, under attack has had to do, you know, which is figure out how to laser focus on um, our mission, on our patients. Um, on um, continuing to advocate to raise money for the services if we need to, um, but we're not going anywhere. We've been around for 102 years now, um, and if anything, we're stronger than ever. Um, that is a little bit of a segue into your first que question, um, which is our new, our new president is Dr. Um, Lena Wen, um, who is actually um, one of Commissioner um, um, Monica, Commissioner Monica's, <laughs> you know, I think you'd get the hyphenated name right, right? Um, uh, actually colleagues, and so you can even weigh in. Um, she's a commissioner for public health in Baltimore, um, an ER physician, so I think if anyone knows how to manage a crisis, it would be, it would be her. But I am personally really excited about this because I think um, Cecile Richards has been a wonderful leader to raise the advocacy um, arm of Planned Parenthood and the political strength and muscle, but what we really are focusing right now, and this is the whole conversation tonight, is about healthcare. And so I think having a physician um, at the helm will be really a terrific way to focus in on all the things that we're talking about, you know, public health, disparities, women's health care. So um, I think it's an exciting time for us. Monica, what can you tell us? Yeah, she's fantastic. I mean, I think uh, she's a superstar. We're part of a, a coalition of what is described as our big city health coalitions. And so she actually, when I was uh, looking at uh, some of the correspondence on Title X over the summer, she was the one among uh, about 30 uh, members who led the way in terms of writing a joint letter that uh, she got many of the health officials and their mayors to sign on to this letter in July. Uh, so she'll be wonderful and uh, she's high energy, really enthusiastic, knows the political climate because she's been in DC, uh, Baltimore, Maryland for quite some time. I think that's where uh, she has roots. And so she's gonna be a wonderful leader and you've got a wonderful leader here in your backyard that I know is also uh, paving the way for uh, just getting ready. You're going to be our gladiators, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One last question over there. Or, yeah, sorry. I'll stand up so you don't have to crane your neck. Hi. Um, I'm a first year law student, and as if the issue of Roe v. Wade and access to abortion care isn't already difficult enough for the communities you all serve. We're also seeing at the national court level issues with crisis pregnancy centers, which are not held to any of the health standards that any of your organizations or any health center is held to. So can any of you elaborate on how the Commonwealth is going to navigate some of these that can 
even though they can hide behind free speech as they did in California, they can also distribute really predatory information to our community. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I'm sorry I didn't give you a high five like the secretary yep. did for the social work, so I'll give you a high, high five. five. Yeah. yeah, I know, yeah. with time. So I think the reason why we're having a hard time is that it's like, where do you begin, yeah. right? I mean, um, again, crazy town. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, there's probably going to need a multi-pronged approach. Um, and I'll let the secretary jump in, but you know, I think from my perspective, especially as a primary care physician, you know, it's it's making sure the clinicians are aware, the public health officials, the people who are on the ground caring for patients, that patients are aware. There's definitely a buyer beware part of this as well, um, and then figuring out ways to kind of legally um, uh, kind of go at uh, go at um, you know the fact that these um, fake clinics basically are. Are, are praying, yeah, you know, fake organizations are preying on um, people who are in distress. To the extent that they, um, so they have been able to be under the legal and regulatory framework that currently exists in Massachusetts. Uh, and one of the things we're sort of looking at internally is what are the what, is, what are the legal and regulatory frameworks that I will, can put in place in order to um, not only allow them not to expand, but to really call them out for what they are. And it's, part of it is, one of the things we're looking at is actually sort of, what I would call sort of false advertising of what they say they are, but what they really aren't. And it's, a, as you point out, it's like they're this very hazy, sort of area, which has been sort of, which is confounding in part. Is, yeah. So who would, who could enforce that? Or are you figuring it out? So they're literally, it's one of the, it's, it's something that has sort of grown and because they're not clinics, so they don't come, they don't come over like, they don't come over under like an existing framework. And so one of the things that you were looking at is, so what is the framework then you create? Um, regulatory, legislatively, uh -huh. um, investigations. I mean, there's lots of, um, there are not lots. There are a few things that we are actually looking at and how to sort of really limit this in Massachusetts. And it has been growing? There's, there's a few in Massachusetts. Yeah. Okay. Can we do one very last question here? Or? Oh, sorry. Oh, wait, okay, so one more qu question upstairs and then one last one here. I'm so sorry, upstairs people. Yeah. <laughs> you did. Glare light. Yeah, you can't really look. Oh. Hi, um, I am actually a volunteer at Planned Parenthood. So, very happy to see all of you. Hello, hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, um, especially given all of the um, discussions around consent and sexual assault and everything that's been in the news this week and last week and many years before that. Um, if you could discuss uh, some of the programs that the state is funding as well as that Planned Parenthood has around educating around consent. Um, sexual health obviously is just as much birth control and family planning as it is around um, teaching people appropriate behaviors and relationships and sexual relationships. So I was hoping you could touch on that. So I can start and then hand off. Um, so thanks for asking that question because that allows me to talk about what we're doing in the school-based uh, health centers and health resource centers. So we actually have a really uh, robust curriculum focused on prevention and working with our youth advisory board and our Start, Start, Start Strong program looking at healthy relationships. We got a lot of uh, attention in the media over the summer and earlier this year on uh, a curriculum around porn, pornography. I didn't know until we dug into it that the students were spending so much time in the curriculum uh, looking at pornography and all the, uh, and I'm sorry, my daughter's in the audience here, so cover <laughs> your ears up. Uh, but being able to, 
because our youth are seeing it and having access to that and teaching them and giving the tools to young people about that's not what a healthy relationship looks like. And social media has perpetuated uh, the magnifying glass and sort of this reality TV, uh, YouTube mentality with our young people. So we do a lot of work with our health educators and through our, our young people who are part of our Boston Area Health Education Center to provide them those tools. Um, and, and, and that goes throughout the high school years. Uh, I also wanted to mention the Family Justice Center, which is a program that we do in partnership with the district attorney, uh, mayor's office, and the uh, commissioner of the Boston Police Department. And that program provides a safe, uh, welcoming space uh, to women, uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. And if you want more information on that, uh, we can provide that offline as well. Massachusetts, so outside of Boston, includes Boston, but outside of Boston. So for all the school-based health centers, um, we've removed um, any referrals to school-based health centers, so students can go in and have access um, to the school-based health center uh, initially, and without any information back to their insurance on the Medicaid side. So we really are trying to open access for those schools that have school-based health centers. So open access, no questions asked. Um, and that, again, was one of those things when I was going around Massachusetts, I was out at the Hilltown Health Center out in the Berkshires, and they were talking about, they were worried about having referrals and the like and consent, and we were like, and then I was in Worcester, and I heard the same thing from the Family Health Center of Worcester. I was like, you know, I came back to the office, I said, I think we have a, a potential of one of those unintended consequences that was limiting access and so literally announced with all the League of the Community Health Centers that so we've eliminated um, in school-based health centers any referrals so students can just go in, get the services they need. So thank you for asking that question. Um, I mean, I think the services, uh, expansion of services, and even just the fact that there are school-based health centers is really important. But the, the question that you asked around consent um, is just critically important now more than ever. Um, and, you know, when I travel across the country and meet with my colleagues who are from all over, one of the things they always say is, oh, you're so lucky you're from Massachusetts, you know, you've got sex ed. And I said, no, 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 we do not have mandatory sex ed in Massachusetts. So it depends on what school district you're in, um, of whether you're going to have access to sex education that talks about healthy relationships, that teaches about consent, that's inclusive. Um, that includes LGBTQ curricula, right? So, so that is one of those things that um, we have spent eight years advocating for across the state. There is overwhelming support um, across the state among voters, um, parents, 90% of parents um, of, of people in Massachusetts feel that schools in Massachusetts should have sex ed in high school, and over 80% believe that in middle school. Yet we are still really having a hard time thinking about having curriculum in schools in Massachusetts that is inclusive and that talks about consent. So I am so glad that you asked that question and I hope that everybody in this room is talking about this and, and making sure that sex education and consent curriculum is really a part of every young person's growing up because it's really, it's, it's what we're seeing today it is, a, is evidence that is way overdue. Put in a plug for the Get Real curriculum that Planned Parenthood developed, which my kids did uh, in middle school. And I wrote a, a piece for WBUR that uh, was headlined, I think, I never expected to love my kids' sex ed course, but I do. And it actually had them role playing consent. And so they could really work stuff through in their heads in such a healthy way. That's a Get Real. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I think we should probably, unless we do this very, very last question. People upstairs, you're, you're, are you well enough? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. This will be this, and then the person in the gray, and then that's really it. And then I'll hand it back to Dr. Grant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm an OBGYN physician assistant, and I currently practice up on the North Shore. I'm a huge proponent of the LARCs. 
all over the place, and I was really interested to hear that you were talking about some funding for a program, because I will tell you one of the problems that we run into, specifically um, postpartum, you know, we do have um, a fair amount of immigrants up on the North Shore, and, you know, it's difficult for them to get transportation because there's not as as much public transportation. And we there is a huge barrier right now where we cannot, even though ACOG says and all of the professional medical societies tell you, you know, you should be putting an IUD in postpartum if that's what the woman wants, there's because of hospital payer barriers, you can't do that. Um, so I'm just wondering if some of this funding you're, you're talking about is going to go towards making that more accessible for these patients in the hospital before they leave yep. so that it doesn't require a separate visit. And so it's not a Medicaid barrier any longer. So you can, so what we've found is that it's, uh, some of it is um, practitioner reluctance. So there's a lot, there's a lot to this. So this is a 1.7 million all provider education, hospital providers, practitioners. Um, it's a statewide initiative. And to really work through the education, the reluctance, the if there's uh, fiscal issues, what the fiscal issues are. But one of the first things I made sure was not going to be a barrier was the Medicaid barrier. So in fact, post-delivery, you can insert. It, or let's just say a, the opportunity for a greater hospital understanding. <laughs> and, and it could be a payer barrier. So I think one of the, um, I mean, one of the great things that the secretary is talking about, I mean, like just go ahead and do it at the state level. But my understanding is that there's one payer that has not unbundled it yet. And it has four letters and it starts with a B. <laughs> so you might want to call them. Good. Last question. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, in the face of a federal government that's really not interested in uh, promoting access to health care, in thinking in a state like Massachusetts that has very large, powerful health systems, what role those health systems can play in sort of stepping up to the plate as a stakeholder and expanding access? I mean, now we, we, as a state and the federal government, spend billions of dollars every year subsidizing these hospitals through tax exemptions. And I'm just wondering if there are ways to possibly um, sort of retailer those tax exemptions or other ways to make hospitals sort of more effective leaders in um, in providing uh, just sort of greater access to care. Right now, the the hospitals that provide disproportionate care to low-income people are the people who have lower rates and are therefore not able to sort of give money to uh, like into the community generally to expand access. So I'm just curious on your thoughts on that. I mean, I actually. Maybe this is, and I don't mean this to be a contrarian view. I actually think that our hospitals and community health centers, um, and not just our safety net hospitals, um, do try to actually provide treatment for individuals. And if you know, no one wants to go through an emergency room to get their medical care, but we we know that so often for people who don't have insurance or. Um, for whatever reasons, do go through emergency rooms. Um, we, in Massachusetts, we offset almost a billion dollars a year in uncompensated care, um, which in a state that has almost universal health care access, you, you know, some people thought, well, we should just eliminate the safety net care pool. And they're like, well, because there's like for five years, people who are newcomers to the United States don't have, can't qualify for Medicaid because of a federal rule. I mean, there's lots of reasons why you need a safety net care pool, uncompensated care pool. So I'd be, um, I'd be happy to talk to you offline a bit because I do think, I don't see that hospitals, I think the big issue for us in Massachusetts is the extraordinary cost of care. Um, like we're the most expensive healthcare system in the United States, which happens to be the most expensive healthcare system in the world. So I don't know about you, and Boston happens to be the most expensive of any place in, in, in the world, apparently, for healthcare spending. So I, I don't know about you, but I don't feel all those healthcare dollars in the right place. So I think there's a distribution issue, but I, I, don't, I don't think hospitals are the barrier in this conversation, per se. So maybe I'm missing the question because it's quarter to eight and I haven't had dinner yet, but. Go ahead, Monica. Well, just to just follow up on that, if the question is, could hospitals be doing more? And the one thing that they have done uh, 
through Secretary Sutters, the governor, and Commissioner Burrell was to revamp uh, the determination of needs, so this process for hospitals. So the example that got a lot of play in the news was Children's Hospital Boston. So a million dollar, uh, it was a billion dollar capital campaign. And uh, they uh, had to, there's a, com there's a requirement that, that they have to give back and reinvest in communities. So $1 billion translates to $53 million. And to their, and that was pre uh, changes to DON, uh, but they have begun to reinvest those uh, funds into uh, neighborhoods that they serve their catchment area. And so at the local level, that's allowed us to have, um, be uh, more formally engaged in a systematic way with hospitals when they're thinking about, well, what am I gonna invest uh, those community dollars in? So I, I think you're right. I'm not sure if it's the hospitals, it's like the overall landscape. It's, it's not one thing, yeah. So to wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you very briefly to say something comforting. <laughs> so, so I was going to ask, my first question was going to be, what keeps you awake at night? But I'd like to end with, when you're awake at night, what do you tell yourself to help yourself go to sleep? <laughs> Monica? Oh, you're starting with me. I was just going to say ditto to go to sleep. Um, I think for me, uh, I, I think... Uh, it's a privilege to be here in the city and in a state. So that helps me stay grounded at the end of the day because we ha we're taking it day by day. Uh, and we have to uh, be resilient. And, and I think we are resilient, not only in the city and the state, but nationally, and I think we are mobilized. So I think that's one way to cope. Hopefully that's comforting, is that we're in a good space. I don't sleep much, so <laughs> so I'm up a, a lot. Um, I, I do think that Massachusetts, and there's a couple of other states that in Kate can engage in very civil discourse, even when there are issues that sort of, we have, there are differences of perspective. I think the fact that uh, we have, I see the strength of Massachusetts around protecting people's rights. Um, legally from a regulatory framework. We sit at the table, even when we have differences of opinions and we try to find the pathway, um, not to consensus, but on a pathway for the next issues. And I think that um, I always have hope. I mean, if I didn't have hope, I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Uh, but on a more serious note, that I do think, hasn't translated real well to date, but that what we do in Massachusetts in a, in, a, in a very bipartisan way on very complicated issues, you can use opioids, you can use the Affordable Care Act, Title 10, what's gonna be public um, charges. It really brings people together in Massachusetts and we have that strength in numbers. Um, our next challenge is taking it outside our, our borders, our boundaries with other states in a, in a greater collective, if you would. We've done it on some individual items, but I do think that that is, I am grateful every day that I live in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, even with all of our issues, and, uh, and we have many here that we need to be spending our time on, but that we live in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm very grateful for that. So I um, would echo my colleagues, but I am very optimistic. I mean, I, I look around and I see people energized and I see them excited and engaged and you know they're doing things and and they're 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 really they're gonna do it and so I really feel you know my kids are 20 almost 23 and 26 um, and they are more engaged in um, in politics and civil life and getting out and voting and their friends are and so I look around the room and I I would echo, I think, um, what the secretary said before, make sure everybody that you know gets out and votes. But, you know, I think that wave of engagement um, and sense of, you know what, we're going to take back our country. Um, that gives me great hope and great optimism, um, as long as I can stay in Massachusetts, too. <laughs> Dr. Grant, I'd like to invite you up. Yeah, before we started, we were talking about the Massachusetts bubble. Like, can we put a wall around the Massachusetts bubble? <laughs> so, um, so first of all, I'd like to just thank Karen for facilitating a wonderful conversation. Thank you. 
thrilled to be here in Massachusetts. I just want to say how fortunate we are to have these incredible women leaders in, in public health issues. So thank you to all of you for what you do every day. You know, public service is not easy. It's not for the faint at heart. And so thank you for um, all the work and the sleepless nights and reading through 472 pages of documents so the rest of us don't have to do that. So much appreciated. And so, Carrie, I'm going to also take your, your charge when you say, what gives me hope? I just spent the last 16 years leading college campuses. And there is a wave of energy and excitement happening on college campuses across the country. And 10 years ago, in August, um, the guy whose name is on this building at the Democratic National Convention said these words. And so let me just have this be the note I end on. But a quick thanks to my team here at the Institute for putting on a wonderful program to WBUR, our partner, to Claire Cooper, Summer Ordaz, and all the folks who make this happen. But let me leave this with you so that we all leave here on a hopeful note. And this is Senator Edward M. Kennedy. For me, this is a season of hope new hope for a justice and fair prosperity for the many, and not just for the few. New hope, and this is the cause of my life, new hope that we will break the old gridlock and guarantee that every American, north, south, east, west, young, old, will have decent, quality health care as a fundamental right and not a privilege. We still have much work to do, but the fight goes on. Thank you all for coming. I hope you'll come back.